We're still talking about Lord Nishingadev after all these days. <laughs> What's wrong with us? We can't stop thinking of Lord Nishingadev. <laughs> I'm gonna get my harmonium. Okay. Bhagavatam <laughs> Ki Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, oh. We had um, some little Vyas Puja celebrations. Tuvimos una pequeña celebración de Vyas Puja. Ah, yeah. Silencio, por favor. Um, and someone offered a, made an offering and we wrote a song. <laughs> the offering was so good. And we created a kirtan from the melody we came up with so we can sing that. <laughs> mm -hmm. On my harmonium that's out of tune. That's another problem. Vidaya Krishna Krishnaya Bhutadaya Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Shramita. Hare 
Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Tagore Premanandi. Now you're wondering, what are the words, right? Um, Leela Shakti wrote some words down, but it's something like, open your heart and let the, the open, yeah, I don't know, like, open your heart and let the mercy in, all answers to your problems will begin, something like that. Open your heart, let the mercy in. All answers to your problems will filter in, will appear. Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutalaya Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Shramiti Manu Namaste Sharashwati Deve Gauravani Pachaya Sanyavari Pachaya Well, Gaurapriya, it looks like you got a home upgrade. She's come out of the village into this. Now she's a city girl. A village girl at heart. A city girl by education. <laughs> Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Where do we leave off, O oh, faithful secretary? Hare Krishna, dear Guru We should be on 7 10 50. Seven. I need someone like Tanya like, to just follow me around and I can say, Where did I put my keys? What do I have to do now? What did that devotee tell me? What's his name? 71050. You know, I think I think the problem is when you teach and study a lot, you lose touch with the actual reality because it's all conceptual. So when you come back to reality, you can't kind of remember. It's like being on a vacation. <laughs> Then you come back from vacation, everything takes a while to readjust to. I come, I like go off in the different worlds of conceptual worlds of philosophy and psychology and Bhagavatam, and it's all not in this world. It's not on this, it's not be here now stuff. So I think that's sometimes contributes to why I forget what I was doing. Yeah, like today, we'll have japa, then I'll have a meeting, then I'll have a meeting, then I'll have another meeting. I'm just living all in concepts. And if I were not a devotee, I would get paid for it. I'd be a professor, get paid to think, which I do anyway. So might as well get paid for what you do anyway, right? <laughs> paid to speculate and come up with crazy ideas, get prizes, the crazier, the better. Not <laughs> English, right? <laughs> uh, as you know, I one of my pastimes is to make fun of the material world. I have a story. It's so funny. It's a true story. Ratchinana Marsh was here. It's been here in Alachua, and he said. Sutapa Prabhu, a devotee in merry old England, told him a story that dog racing is popular in England, and he went to a dog race before he was a devotee. And the way, I don't know if you know this, I never knew this, the way they get the, the dogs to run is they have a, a plastic rabbit, and they put the plastic rabbit, I guess it's... Um, what remotely controlled 
And so they all run after the rabbit. And so this one dog, he was running after the rabbit. And when he finally got close to the rabbit, he saw it was plastic. And he's like, oh, damn, why am I running after a plastic rabbit? So he just stopped. And all the other dogs were running and he's walking. And he said, that's just like us when you come to spiritual life, when you realize you're in the dog race and you realize we're running after a plastic rabbit. It's all illusion, you stop the dog race and you're just like, why do I want to do this? Why do I want to compete to be the number one dog? You know, in the Bhagavatam, Svavid Varahosta Karai Samstuda Purusham Pushu. There's this verse that people who are like dogs, hogs, camels, and asses will appreciate other people who are like dogs, hogs, camels, and asses. So these analogies are given, a dog is, he just needs a master, so he just works all day for somebody. Hog will eat and have sex all day. Camels will <clears throat> chew thorns and eat their blood, and they think it tastes good, but it's eating their blood, and that's compared with sex because you lose your blood in the form of semen. And asses also, they work very hard for some grass, but you can get the grass anywhere, but they think they can't. So if you're not a dog, if you don't want to be a dog, hog, camel, or ass, you're trying not to be, then people are going to say, what's wrong with you? You're not a dog, hog, camel, or ass, like all of us. If someone says what's wrong with you, I would take that as the highest compliment you could possibly get. It just is. It's a great compliment. If no one's ever said what's wrong with you, just get married, they'll say it. No problem. But aside from your husband or wife, if no one has ever said what's wrong with you, you must be doing something wrong. At one time, not one time, many times, <clears throat> in our preaching, we would be criticized. And there would be bad reports in the media, and we, we don't want these things, but Prabhupada said, they're feeling the weight of the Hare Krishna movement, because they're complaining. We see people everywhere, why don't you get a job, what are you contributing to society, you're just parasites, you're just nuisance. You, all our kids are becoming Hare Krishnas, you're taking them away from their families and their former religions. And Prabhupada would say, they're feeling the weight. And then he would say, if there's no bad publicity, you must be doing something wrong. Because preaching means you're challenging material society. Like, you're going to run for president. You're going to say, when I'm president, I will close all the liquor shops and all the discos and all the pubs and all the McDonald's and Jack in the Box and Colonel said, I will close it all. About three seconds later, you'll be dead. Right? That's the price for speaking the truth. People won't like it. Uh, everybody likes everything you said. You must not be saying the right thing. So, as I said, it's not that we want, that we are callous to what people think. That's not Prabhupada's point. He wants people to appreciate us. But if you speak something that's true and you speak it nicely and still they don't appreciate it, or you, you go on chanting on the street and they think you're a bunch of crazies or dropouts or lazy people, what can you do? Hare Krishna. I've, I've written about my coming to Krishna consciousness. And actually, when I read it, you can see that I kind of dropped out of society while I was still in university. I guess I wasn't part of it. I wasn't planning to make that part of my life because, because I could see through it. And when you can see through something, it's very hard to participate in it. And that's why Lord Brahma created different illusions. Because we didn't create illusions, because we've come, we came to the material world to enjoy it. If Brahma didn't create illusions, you wouldn't be able to enjoy it. 
you know, it's like you bring your kids to Disneyland or something. Disneyland, they like paint every week and they polish the brass, the metal, they polish it every day. So everything looks like it was created the day you walked in there. It's like a fantasy land. So you don't want to tell the kids actually, there is no Mickey Mouse. And this is just a fake building, you know, there's nothing inside. It just looks like a castle from the outside. And actually there is no Santa Claus. It's just a big fat guy who can't find a job or some old grandfather that likes kids. And hopefully he likes them for the right reason. So, you know, that would, um, and the tooth fairy, it w there is no tooth fairy. I just put the money under your pillow. My daughter figured that out, I think the third year. That would uh, ruin everything, right? So you don't tell your kids there's no Santa Claus. They figure it out. You don't tell them this and that. You, you take them to SeaWorld and they have all these dolphins. You don't tell them how these dolphins are completely um, gone crazy because they're locked up and do all this training. You don't tell them that. That would ruin it for them, right? So you wanna keep the illusion going because that's where all the fun is. So the material world is created solely for the purpose of conditioned souls who wanna forget their position as servants, who wanna forget Krishna, and wanna go into some competition with him, try to imitate him, which is a really bad idea. You probably figured that one out by now. But in order to do that, Lord Brahma has to create illusion because if there's no illusion, you wouldn't do that. You, you would think this is really stupid, right? Think like, what am I doing competing with God? What, am I an idiot or what? You would just stop. Like all the realizations you have when you start to become Krishna conscious. What am I doing with my life? Why am I doing this? What's the purpose? People are crazy. They're working so hard for what? And in 50 years, it's all gonna be gone and they'll have their name on a street sign and that's about it. So when illusion is dispelled, then naturally becomes difficult to engage in material activity, right? Because you see it's pointless. That's the price you pay. So I was reading my biography. It's not a, bio, it's not a biography. It's a, it's a book for non devotees but I was telling them about my life in university. And I, I was just reading it this morning because we're gonna do some videos on it. And Gopi Jeevan is here, we're gonna discuss it. So I was reading it before class, just to prepare for the meeting. And as I was reading it, it was, it was like, yeah, you were in university, but you had already dropped out. And you already figured it out. Even before you read Bhagavad Gita, you, you figured out it wasn't right. You just didn't know why it wasn't right, but you knew it wasn't right. And when you read Bhagavad Gita, then you knew why it wasn't right. and then. You completely dropped, you've, then you physically dropped instead of just internally. So that's um, all of you who want to enjoy the material world. You should not read Prabhupada's books because <clears throat> it simply will rain on your parade. Listen to this quote, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to shake you to the core. I just, <clears throat> I just heard this yesterday. This was told to a devotee by Prabhupada. The devotee's name is Vasudev. If you don't read my books, you're putting your life in danger. If you don't read my books, you're putting your life in danger. Anuradha, can you write that down? Tell Radha Priya to put it on Facebook. That's a quote from Prabhupada. If you don't read my books, you're putting your life in danger. Now, I'll tell you something else I heard, which does not relate to what we're talking about, but it's so uniquely interesting and funny and tragic at the same time that I have to tell you. Maybe Katie will get the most from this. 
Prabhupada said that the British Raj was opulent because of everything they stole from India. And after independence, the British Raj went downhill. That was the day it started going downhill. Then Prabhupada said, someday Britain, that country will become beggars because of what they've done to India. And Prabhupada said, the British are very proud. And Prabhupada said, <clears throat> I don't know if Prabhupada was joking or this is true, but you can decide for yourself. He said, Prabhupada, do you ever see a camel, how they walk with their head up? He said, those camels in India walking around like that, those are the British. Those were the British that have taken their birth as camels in India. If you ask me if Prabhupada was joking or not, I'll say he was serious. Because Prabhupada has said things about people taking birth that are worse than that. So anyway, you can take it with a grain of salt or you can take it without the grain of salt. But just don't be proud and don't steal. And um, yeah, that's another point. Okay. That's the introduction to today's class, but has absolutely nothing to do with today's class. But it was just on my mind, so I thought I would share it with you. Okay, so this is 10, this is chapter seven, text 10, verse 50. Hare Krishna. My voice has disappeared. I don't know where it's gone. I've been looking for it all morning. <clears throat> And I cannot find it, in spite of my Chinese medicine, can't even find it. Two kinds of Chinese medicine, still can't find it. What to do? Maybe by talking it'll come back. Vastu-tat-yo-pavanitam <laughs> Manena bhaktyo prashamena pujita prasidatam esha sasat patam pati. Exalted persons like Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma could not properly describe <coughs> the truth of the Supreme Personality of God at Krishna. <coughs> May the Lord, who is always worshipped as the protector of all devotees, by great saints who observe vows of silence, meditation, devotional service, and renunciation, be pleased with us. Hmm. Purport. The absolute truth is sought by different persons in different ways, yet he remains inconceivable. Nonetheless, devotees like the Pandavas, the Gopis, the Coward Boys, Mother Jashoda, Nanda Maharaja, and all the inhabitants of Vrindavan do not need to practice conventional processes of meditation to attain the Supreme Personality of Godhead, for he remains with them through thick and thin. Therefore, a saint like Narada, understanding the difference between transcendentalist and pure devotees, always prays that the Lord will be pleased with him. Hmm. Hmm. I've gone blank here trying to make this connection. I'm going to read it again. Brain has gone dead. I know that doesn't happen often, but I'm stumped right now. So uh, the verse is saying, Narada Muni is saying, Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma cannot properly describe you. But may you, the Lord, 
was always worshipped as the protector of all devotees by the real great devotees, great saints who observe vows of meditation, silence, devotional service, be pleased with us. And then Prabhupada says, glorifies the residents of Vrindavan, who just love Krishna and therefore says, Narada, a saint, understanding the difference between transcendentalists and pure devotees, always prays that the Lord will be pleased with him. Meaning that he wants to be like the residents of Vrindavan, not just like a meditator. So we have this picture in front of us of Vrindavan, and we have the devotees of Vrindavan. And as we said, these devotees are our examples of what is bhakti. Specifically, they're showing us or they're dispelling our misconception about what love is. Because we use that word so cheaply, don't we? Oh, I just love that church on. What does that mean? A lot of times it means I like the melody, gave me a lot of pleasure. Well, what about the name? Oh, the name's okay, but the melody, that's what I love. Right? Sometimes that's what it means. I love this halibut. What does it mean? My tongue is liking the taste of this halibut. That's what it means. It's, it's supposed to mean, I love the fact that this halibut was made so well that Krishna enjoyed it. That's what it's supposed to mean. Right? So you taste this halibut. And, wow. Krishna must have really enjoyed it. But instead we say, wow, I really enjoy it. I mean, I'm loving this halibut. So now, when we hear about the residents of Braj, sometimes we have this problem, like figuring out how what they're doing is love, because we're thinking, well, if I did that, it wouldn't be love. Like the gopis are kissing Krishna. Like, how is kissing Krishna love? And the gopis say, Krishna, we want to touch your lips. We want you to kiss us. And like, how is that love? That just sounds like what I want to do with some girl. Yeah, that's the problem. So when you when you look at the leelas of Krishna and you live a life of austerity and sense control, there's, there's a good chance you'll understand it. But if you live a life of too much sense gratification and material comfort, it's a very good chance you'll completely misunderstand it as something material. So, I was speaking with Sachin Andan Swami, and he was saying that um, he's saying that the problem with our japa is that we think we're the body. We had we are merged in false ego, defending, identifying with the body, protecting the false ego, all attachments. We have so many attachments and so on. So he's saying, you know, we have to. We have to help devotees transcend our false ego so they can chant without offense. I said, how are you going to do that? How, you know, what do you, what's the strategy to blast the false ego into little bits and put it in the dustbin, say goodbye to the false ego? He said, I have to convince them that because of material desire, they cannot, they're not tasting the holy name. And that taste is so amazing that you're just depriving yourself of that. Have to convince them there's, that, that if you give this up, if you pay 16 rounds a day without offense, you will get this. Have to convince them of that. Exactly my point. So, you want to understand Radha and Krishna, and you don't want to do some tapasya. Doesn't work like that. Okay, I don't want to do tapasya, 
but I want to understand Radha and Krishna. Therefore, I want to do tapasya so I can understand them. So that's why you want to do it. Correct? Correcto. TK? We, we, we. CC? Yeah, yeah, good. So always remember this. So remember this. The price you're paying is some self sacrifice. But what you're getting is you're entering into the depths of Radha Krishna Lila. There could be nothing better than that. And there could be no price too great for that. But if you want to remain just living a very easy life without much austerity and much effort to purify yourself, you may not understand Radha Krishna Lila. You may have to come around again to understand it. So that's why devotees like austerity. They don't like austerity because it's painful, but they like the results of austerity. Nobody likes austerity. But we like the results of austerity. Therefore, we like austerity. I love it even if I don't love it because I love the result of it. Correct? Yeah. And that's why we don't like sense gratification because we like it, but we don't like the results of it. So we actually don't like it. So let's flip it around. Hare Krishna. Okay, let's read the next verse. Saesha Bhagavan Rajan Vyatanod Vihatam Yashaha Pura Rudrasya Devasya Mainananta Maina. My dear King Yudhisthira, long ago in history, a demon known as Maya Dhanava, who was very expert in technical knowledge, reduced the reputation of Lord Shiva. In that situation, Krishna, the Supreme Personality of God, had saved Lord Shiva. That's an interesting verse for all the, those who think Shiva is the Supreme. If he's the Supreme, why did he need to be saved by Krishna? Lord Shiva is known as Mahadev, <clears throat> the most exalted demigod. Thus Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says that although Lord Brahma did not know the glories of the Supreme Personality of God, Lord Shiva could have known them. This historical incident proves that Lord Shiva derives power from Lord Krishna, Param Brahman. So, okay, obviously you can't understand Krishna's glories. At the same time, if he wants you to understand them, then you can, because you can understand anything he allows you to understand. Prabhupada was asked, Srila Prabhupada, do you know, do you know everything? Prabhupada said, I know everything Krishna wants me to know. What an answer, right? I know everything Krishna wants me to know. And the disciple should know everything the guru knows. So, mm, yeah. So this purport Prabhupada saying. Lord Shiva is getting his power from Lord Krishna. So we're all, as conditioned souls, trying to spread Krishna consciousness. We, the first thing we need to understand is that it's not a material process. So you don't succeed in spreading Krishna consciousness solely by being materially qualified. We, we should be materially qualified in what we're doing, no doubt. 
Otherwise we can make a huge mess. But if I'm only successful materially, how will I purify all the people that I'm attracting? I won't be able to, so it'll be a, it'll be a false ISKCON, Apondraka ISKCON, not the real thing. Nobody will become purified or not as purified as they should be. So we all feel pretty unqualified, but how do we become empowered? Empowerment comes from being willing to be used. That's all. Well, Krishna, you want me to do this? I will make the effort. If, you're, if you want to use me, use me. I have no resistance. The resistance comes from thinking, um, I, I can't do this. And it's almost like we turn off the, the potential empowerment. We turn it off. You know, Krishna, like... Choose somebody else, I can't do this. But I was thinking the other day that so many amazing things happened in the spreading of Krishna consciousness during Prabhupada's time and for myself also. <clears throat> and it was obvious because we were young devotees, it was obvious that we weren't doing it. It wasn't like we're puffed up, you know. It's like if, you know, you came across some stock because your uncle said buy this stock and you buy it today and tomorrow you're a billionaire. You're not gonna think, hey, I'm like the best businessman ever. I made a billion dollars in a day. You're not gonna think that way because you didn't do anything. You just did what somebody told you and somehow it worked. So, the success we were having was obviously not because of our qualification. We didn't become proud because we didn't have anything to be proud of. Now we're a little more advanced, so we have more to be proud of. So now if we do something great, we become proud. But then it was pretty obvious that any success we had was certainly not coming from us. And we did lots of amazing things. I was thinking about this yesterday like all these devotees that I was able to make as a young devotee. Like, how did that happen? What did I know? These people were ready to become devotees. And so Krishna said, okay, here's a devotee, go. He, he gets up in the morning, he goes Mangarti. You can follow him. It's about basically it. He has faith in me, so you can follow him. So Krishna sent, sent them, so many. And that was the same for all over the movement. It was like that. So many people were coming. Um, even we're very young devotees, but so many people, Krishna sees, so here's someone who'll take care of them. Let's send these people. Now, all these people in your city who weren't interested in Krishna, now that you're here, ready to take care of them, all of a sudden they're, they're going to be interested in Krishna. It's just going to sprout. It's just waiting for somebody like you to show up, take responsibility. So it's on Krishna, when you get that new temple, so many people are going to show up out of nowhere. You didn't even know they existed. They're just going to show up because you have a place for them. You know, sometimes the temples want to say, want to make brahmacharis. We want more brahmacharis. We want more brahmacharinis. I'm like, well, where are they going to live? Uh, who's going to take care of them? I don't know. Well, Krishna's like, no, not in your temple. We're not sending any. We're sending them to the temple that can take care of them. So it's not like you're better or worse. You're just more willing and more prepared. But then Krishna uses you. That's our whole philosophy, right? Bhaktya mam abhijananti yavanyas chasmi tattataha. You can know me how? By studying Vedanta Sutra. And that's not what Krishna said. You can know me by being a devotee. That's it. That's all.
Don't be afraid to step out of the box. Because Krishna's out of the box, he's outside that box and he'll hold you up. Not even he holds you up. Krishna's, Krishna will do it and you're just assisting. That's how you have to see it. You, Krishna can do everything when he wants, how he wants, with whomever he wants. So you never think it's you, just think, well, Krishna's looking for somebody, he will assist them. That's it. And then once you're willing, Krishna says, okay, here's the Shakti, I'll give you the Shakti, here's the money, here's the strength, here's the intelligence, so many things. Then it happens because because you're willing to help and he's he wants the job done, so he's got to help you, right? Isn't it? So don't be afraid. Oh, it's so much fun to step out of your comfort zone. All the fun is out of the comfort zone. There's no fun to be in the comfort zone. Step out on the ledge and take a jump. It's exciting. But what if Krishna doesn't catch me? No, well, at least you tried. At least you followed my orders. I'll take response. If you, if you break a leg and end up in the hospital, you can blame me. I'll take responsibility. But my guru told me to jump off the cliff, and that's what I did. And if you break your leg, then I'll say, I guess Krishna didn't want to save you for some reason. No, that's not going to happen. As long as you're willing, he'll save you, for sure. How do we understand Brahma? Yeah, sometimes Brahma doesn't understand Krishna. He understood later. It's, well, there's different Brahmas also, different ages. So not all Brahmas are not all Brahmas are singing Govinda Madi Purusham Tamaham. Some Brahmas are singing I'm the greatest thing you've ever seen. Something more like that. There's different Brahmas because they're living entities who take that position. Brahmas, Brahma is a position. Changes. That's a hard position, be humble. Just be a Brahma and be humble, good luck. Oh, Govinda. This this is the problem when I get up early. It's so nice to get up early because I have so many things that I have to work on that require brain work. I'm like quiet and I have to get up early. But now it's like seven hours after I got up and I'm like, that's the problem. Hare Krishna, what to do? Inspire me, wake me up. Ask some provocative question, like controversy. Just give me a controversial question. Well, some people say this, and some gurus say that, and my temple president says this, and the GBC says that, and you say this, so what is the truth? Yeah, some question like that. That ought to wake me up. Okay, we'll go to text 52. And somebody out there is thinking, if you don't wake up reading Bhagavatam and put you to sleep, I feel sorry for you. And they're right. Text 52. Rajovacha kasmin karmani devasya mayohan jagad ishituhu yatako pachita kirti krishna nanena yatayatam katayatam Yudhisthira Maharaj said, for what reason did the Dima Mayadanava vanquish Lord Shiva's reputation? How did Lord Krishna save Lord Shiva and expand his reputation again? Kindly describe these incidents. 
now it looks it appears that we have finished talking about Lord Shingadev, right? This morning I was thinking we could read about Maharaj Vena. And the reason I was thinking of that is there's a lot of Maharaj Venas out there right now. Maharaj Vena was a real rascal. Uh, rascal would be a nice word, compliment for him. But I think he embodies some of the qualities of the leaders we're seeing today in the world. And I thought it would be interesting to read about him and how the Brahmins dealt with him. What do you think? Because this Shringadev story is basically over. Is that okay with all of you? Or you want to keep reading this chapter? I mean, how many verses are left? It's a different story now. Hmm. I think we've, I think we're okay now. The story of King Vena. This is from the fourth canto, chapter 14. The reason, the reason I'm, I'm thinking now that a lot of you near, need to hear the Bhagavatam rather than me just rambling on with my jokes about how bad everything is and how stupid people are and like that. I mean, that's helpful, but I think we also need to hear the Bhagavatam, at least as the basis and discuss it more because it's our scripture. The creme de la creme. Right? You agree, Hamant? We need to hear more Bhagavatam. Because it takes some time to develop an attachment for it. And it also, I think for some people, it takes time to understand the relevancy of it. I think, like, what is this? Do I have stories about this Vena who lived billions of years ago? Like, what does it have to do with anything? I'm just trying to pay my bills. But as you read it more and more, you see that actually it's all relevant. Maybe not obvious in the beginning, but we'll try to make it obvious and we'll try to discuss the relevancy, relevancy of it. Okay, so this is Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 4, Chapter 14, Text Number 1. Maitreyo Vacha, Brigvadhaya Stemunayo, Lokanam Shemadar Shinaha. Looking at the last chapter first. And so the last chapter is <clears throat> Maharaj Vena's father, Pritamaraj. I think it's Pritamaraj, correct? Is it Prito? Prito. Um, he left Banaprast. Now we have now we have Venu. No, it's Maharaj Anga. Sorry. The great sage Maitreya continued, O great hero of Vidura, the great sage is headed by Brigu. We're always thinking of the welfare of the people in general. When they saw that in the absence of King Anga, there was no one to protect the citizens of the people, they understood that without a ruler, the people would become independent and unregulated. So Maharaj Anga went, he left. But as you could see here from this story, it's the duty of the Brahmins. Right? We're like, now there's no king, Anga's left. What, what are we gonna do? Let, you know, some, just some anybody just become the next ruler? No. So there, what happened was Marjan got left, went to the forest. And there was nobody to take over his kingdom. What happens when there's no king? When the cat's away, the mouse, the mice will play. It's human nature. When the leader goes, everybody messes around. So that's what happened. And so now the Brahmins are thinking, okay, 
what are we going to do now? So they're going to appoint Maharaj Vin, which is going to prove to be as much or a bigger disaster as not having a king at all. Sometimes some things are better left alone. Even they're not good. So that's what happened. Okay. A great hero, Bidura, the great sages headed by Brigham, were always thinking of the welfare of people in general. When they saw that in the absence of King Anga, there was no one to protect the interests of the people, they understood that without a ruler, people would become independent and unregulated. Basically, they would become whimsical and do whatever they pleased. And because your average person is not very elevated. If they do whatever they want, they're gonna do a lot of wrong things. In this verse, the significant word is shema darshinaha, which refers to those who are always looking after the welfare of the people in general. All the great sages headed by Brigham were always thinking of how to elevate all the people of the universe to the spiritual platform. Indeed, they advised the kings of every planet to rule the people with the, that ultimate goal of life in mind. The great sages used to advise the head of state or the king, and he used to rule the populace in accordance with their instructions. Uh. After the disappearance of King Anga, there was no one to follow the instructions of the great sages. Consequently, all the citizens became unruly, so much so they could be compared to animals. Crazy, huh? As described in Bhagavad Gita, human society must be divided into four orders according to quality and work. In every society, there must be an intelligent class, administrative class, productive class, and worker class. In modern society, these scientific divisions are turned topsy-turvy, and by vote, shudras or workers are chosen for administrative posts. Having no knowledge of the ultimate goal of life, such persons whimsically enact laws without knowledge of life's pure purpose. The result is that no one is happy. Hare Krishna. Okay, I think I need to take questions now. Keep me awake. So ask your question, figure out your question and wake me up when you have it. Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll stand on my bed of nails. I have a bed, basically a bed of nails. This is my bed of nails. It's, a, it's not a bed of nails, it's a bed of thumbtacks. And I'm going to stand on it, and you're going to watch me suffer. But I think it'll keep me awake. You're not going to see my face, so you're spared the mercy. Yes, yeah, sorry that you don't see me. I'm standing on a bed of nails as long as I can. When you come to my office, I'll have you stand on it. We'll have competition. How long you can stand? All the macho men can try to compete with me. Okay, can someone read, if there's a question, read it out so I can stand on this. Are there any questions, Tanya? I don't see any questions. There's just my comment and, uh, and Katie's comment. Let's hear your comment. My comment was that uh my father told me that there was no santa claus when i was three or four <laughs> you know okay i'm gonna get off this but i don't think most people can stand on this for more than three seconds you notice how long i've been on it right this is the test of a bona fide guru how long they can stand on this just want you to just want you to know that in the Mahatma Purana. You know how um, Prabhupada would say, you know, these gurus can do things, you know, lay on a bed of nails, you know, this is, this is not, 
this is not the qualification. Um, yeah, so there's a problem with truth. The problem is nobody wants it. Because the way Krishna created this world is that the truth is of this world is ugly. And so everyone wants to pretend that the truths of this world are either not ugly or don't exist. They don't want to admit it because if they're all ugly, what are they going to do? Just go home and cry. But for devotees, the ugliness of the truth is our impetus to go into reality, the real reality. You know, we say, I have, I have problems with reality. Yeah. So people think, oh, you're a devotee, you're escaping reality. No. We're entering reality because we have a problem with the so-called reality. And you also have the problem, but you haven't admitted it, which is why you're not trying to escape it. You're trying to enjoy it. We realized it was a dream. You're going back to sleep to reactivate the dream and enjoy it. That's the difference. Katie, how did you feel when you found out Santa Claus was just an old guy with a fake beard? Or sometimes not fake. Sometimes uh, not that old. And sometimes not that fat. She's not here. Huh? Could you hear me? It was me, not Katie. <laughs> oh, it was you. How'd you feel? I was... It was pretty logical. <laughs> See, she's so smart. She figured it out at the age of how old were you? Six? No, three, four. I don't know. Oh, look at that. She was already a genius at three. She figured everything out. If you can figure out the Santa Claus is bogus at three, you're qualified to become a devotee. You can break through any illusion, right? You know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I was thinking about this the other day, you know. I was asking myself, like, like, why did you get married? Were you like trying to enjoy? And I was like, no, I wasn't trying to enjoy. Because, because from day one, we learned that Krishna is the enjoyer. So like, all right, Krishna is the enjoyer. Why would you get married? It's just like, doesn't make any sense. So I can eat ice cream every day because if I live in the ashram, there'd be no ice cream, maybe once a year. It's not why you get married. I mean, I could be, why? But it's not supposed to be, why? But I was just asking myself, why? It wasn't, it wasn't to enjoy. It was just, I felt that was, for me, at the state that I was in at the time, I thought that was the best ashram to be. So it was the consideration of ashram, not sense gratification. Of course, it's an ashram where sense gratification is allowed, but it's not the goal of the ashram. You don't get married to have sense gratification. You get married because you feel that will be the best thing for your devotional service. Santa Claus is delivering presents to devotees. That makes him a dasa das anadas. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah. So in this way, in the life of a devotee, there's no sense gratification. No. So when your kids are like one years old, and Himan says, tell them really, you're like, they're like, let's go see Santa Claus. You, go, you believe in Santa Claus? What's wrong with you? Don't you have a brain? There's no Santa Claus. That's just some fat guy. <laughs> I don't know. Not at one years old, maybe you want to wait a little bit. Well, it depends on your parenting tactics. We're, we're devotees, we don't believe in Santa Claus. Um, it's so interesting, these cultural traditions. Ra Raksha Bandha, I was in Mauritius, and then Raksha Bandha, all the brahmacharis and Brahm brahmacharinis were exchanging bracelets or whatever you give on the tying. It's kind of like perversion of Valentine's Day or something. I'm like, what do you do? You know, you hear, you know, some brahmacharya comes up to you. Here, here, Devi, I want, you know, it's like a brother and sister type thing, but you know, it's quite innocent. I'm like, why are you doing this? This is not our Vaishnava culture. 
Oh, no, but we do. We've been doing all our life. We can't stop. Yeah. So sometimes you can't stop people from doing, you know, going to this puja. Why? Uh, done it for 50 years. I can't stop now. <clears throat> it's interesting how culture gets in your skin. You come to America, you know, devotees, you know, have Christmas trees. And like, like why have a Christmas tree? Well, it's because we have kids. And everybody's getting presents and they want to celebrate. You know? So you have to make those decisions yourself. You know, how, when you want to tell your kids there's no Santa Claus or if Christmas is bogus or what you want to do. But you have to replace it with something, right? You can't just strip them, give them nothing. You got to have other festivals, right? And all their friends are doing it, and you won't let them do it. They like grow up hating you, maybe. It could happen. My parents never let me do this and that. Now they just go to the bar every day to get back at their parents. These things happen. So some balance may be required. And, you know, it really wasn't Prabhupada's idea that he'll come to the West and completely just change everything everybody does from A to Z in their culture it really wasn't his plan. It was to add Krishna in it. We have a comment from Diane Jackson. They came to school and announced there is no Santa. <laughs> Man, there must have been a riot in school. Announced there's no Santa and I have have to have the hush talk with him. I teach kindergarten. Oh my God, it's been devastating. What did you do? First give out tissues and then make the announcement. Now you could replace Santa Claus by giving them prasadam. How to act when you, this is from Toshin, how to act when you are in a situation where it's better to lie to everybody than to tell the truth. He says, well, you'll be hurt when he knows the truth. What a question. Should I lie to you about the answer? <laughs> because it might hurt you. <laughs> I think it's so hard because I don't know. Um, yeah, do you know that story? I told this story before. Maybe this will partially answer the question. Our, our concern is to have good relationships with devotees, and our concern is that devotees should be inspired. So this one devotee, he joined, he was a young devotee, and he liked to play music, so he had a guitar and was driving everybody crazy with his music, singing his songs. Oh, Krishna, I love you, because you are so blue. Oh, Krishna, you are, you know, it's like kind of really, you know, new bhakta songs. So they went to Prabhupada complaining. He's driving everybody nuts with his guitar and his songs. So Prabhupada said, call him, I will talk to him. And Prabhupada said, I hear that you sing very nice songs. So why don't you take your guitar, leave Mayapur, go around the world, singing your songs about Krishna, people will appreciate it. And he said, yes, Prabhupada. Next day he left. Prabhupada got rid of him. So Prabhupada didn't tell a lie. He just, you know, sometimes you're not lying. You just don't say anything, right? I mean, that's a kind of lie, right? But, but Prabhupada didn't want to discourage him. You know, everybody hates you. So why don't you just leave? They hate your guitar. They hate your songs. They hate you. Everything about you from head to toe just stinks. So get out of here. Prabhupada would never do that. He's encourage him. There are many stories like that. There's another story. This is 1968 when devotees did, knew very little, especially about deity worship. And so this is one devotee. Her name is Kanchambala. Kanchambala. She was like 17 or 16 or something, yeah, something like that. 
so she was becoming a devotee and she was in high school and she had an altar at home. And she was like an earthy girl. So she would put like branches on her altar and, you know, leaves and different kinds of things. You know, things just grow wild. Those, you ever see those things that look like cotton? I don't know what they call them. They grow all over my property. Cottontail or something, you know. Just putting all these things that you would never put on an altar, right? Just, you know, all the stuff that she thought was really good and Krishna would like. And so Prabhupada understood she was putting on her altar what she thought Krishna would like because she liked it. And normally we think whatever we like, everybody likes, right? Not, you know, it's kind of like innocent, innocent, well, well intentioned innocence, but because, you know, you like something, you know, you like pizza, you assume everybody likes pizza, which is probably true, except a few rare people. But so that's what she did. And Prabhupada wrote her this beautiful letter. And he said, that, I can see that Krishna is giving you intelligence how to serve him. That's like, you know, that's like against every rule of deity worship practically, you know. Offer the, you know, you offer fragrant flowers and like that. Although you can offer mango leaves, that's auspicious. But um, why did Prabhupada say that? You could say, Toshan, you could say, well, Prabhupada was lying to her because those are all the wrong things to offer. And he's glorifying her. Krishna is giving you intelligence because he saw the sincerity. So from Prabhupada's perspective, why would you want to correct somebody who did something sincerely, and it was just an altar at home, so it doesn't really matter, it's your home altar, you can, you know, whatever you think Krishna would like, and if you don't know what he'll like, you just offer that, and that's your, and Krishna accepts it. It's the title of another, my, one of my books. I think we mentioned this book, Krishna Likes Banana Pills Better Than Bananas. You know that book? Have you heard about that book? It's in the atmosphere, it hasn't been written yet. Krishna likes banana peels better than bananas. What's that book about? Who knows? It's about Krishna eating banana peels and bananas being thrown away. And he ate them. Does Krishna really like banana peels better? When it's offered with love, he does. So that's what Prabhupada saw. If Krishna can eat banana peels, Kanchambala can offer pieces of bark and cottontails and twigs and leaves on her altar because that was bhakti. So um, I also heard, I never heard directly from Prabhupada, but one devotee told me is that sometimes when you're teaching people, there's an art of knowing what to say and an art of knowing what not to say. So you know my joke, Bhakta Bozo gives the Sunday feast and he only talks about three things. Number one, women are less intelligent. Number two, they didn't go to the moon. And what's number three? I forgot. So there's third one. Anybody remember number three? Kind of like, you know, blacks, black people are thieves or something, you know, something like, Black people are low caste, something like that, yeah. Make sure, Bhakta Bozo, you always discuss these three topics, like you know, it's upsetting to women to hear that, that hear someone say that they're less intelligent and you know, go through Prabhupada's lectures. I never heard him say it in a lecture. You know, it's there in some books, and we don't even understand it that well in the first place. You need a whole lecture just to explain it, what it means. And at the end of a lecture, you just, you just say, well, you're all devotee women, you're all the most intelligent. And everything's mixed up in Kali Yuga anyway, after you try to explain what it means. But eventually you come to realize it doesn't mean a whole lot in Kali Yuga. Everybody knows the differences between men and women anyway. Um, and you know, um, so Prabhupada didn't go there. He spoke what he had to speak. He understood his audience. 
So you want to give me the example, Toshan? Or is it confidential? Because it's I can only answer answer generally. Um, is it um, well if it's a surprise party, you don't want to tell them, right? Surprise birthday party, definitely. But you're having a surprise. I hope you're not having a surprise party. Me? Put on a surprise party? Are you kidding? I'd do that. And then she gets home from work and ah, 5,000 people in the house. Yeah. Of course, you have to lie for that. Anyway, I won't put you on the spot if you don't want to say. But the principle is you want to inspire someone and you don't want to discourage them. At the same time, you don't want to. Um, deprive them of knowing what they need to know, if they need to know it, because that would be unkind, even though it might be hurtful to them, but if they need to know it. Prabhu, I just want to tell you, it looks like you're about to walk off the roof of this house, and we're on the 87th floor, probably a bad idea. Don't tell me what to do. You know, no, I'm going to tell you what to do, because if I don't, you're going to die. So yeah, in that case, just tell them the truth. But if they're just walking slowly there to say, hey, we've got some pizza, you wanna come inside? Oh, sure, okay, no problem. You don't have to tell them they're about to walk off the roof. So you wanna be expert at what inspires people, that's, that's the idea. So in the early days of the movement, when the Bodhis, you know, Prabhupada was giving, he started gradually giving some rules because in the beginning, he didn't give him any rules. So he's gradually giving some rules. And the devotee said, Prabhupada, are there more rules to follow? Prabhupada said, yes, yes. But if I told you all the rules, you would faint. So many of them, and it's so difficult to follow. So he didn't tell us, told us what was important. Okay, if I say anything more, I could get kicked out of this gun for telling people to lie. Generally, I would say that was not, I don't even, I don't want to say generally, Prabhupada didn't want us to lie. One time he said, but if you exaggerate about Krishna, so-called lie about Krishna, it's not a lie because whatever you say about him is true, even if you make it up. because he's everything and unlimited. So whatever you say would describe him. And then this whole conversation actually came up during Prabhupada's time about being honest and truthful. And Prabhupada said, the most honest thing you can do is give people Krishna. And the most dishonest thing you can do is give people something other than Krishna. Because Krishna is the supreme truth. Get real, Prabhu. Well, what's real, Krishna? So, if I tell a white lie to get you to come to the temple and meet Krishna, I'm giving you the highest truth. <laughs> and if I'm truthful and you've never come to the temple, then I'm I'm ultimately lying to you because you don't have the truth now. So that's, that's another perception. That's transcendental to morality. You know, you know the story. These, these gang members are running after someone to kill them who's innocent for I don't know why. And there's a Brahmin there and they're running, uh, they're running ahead of these gangsters and they tell the Brahmin, we need a place to hide. Can we hide in your house? He says, yes. A few minutes later, the gangsters come and said, have you seen such and such a man? Now you're a Brahmin, you're sworn to truthfulness. What do you say? Because you know, if you say yes, they're gonna be killed. And if you say no, you'll be lying. And truthfulness is important for a Brahmin. So what do you do, Toshan, in that situation? 
you take a class in Krishna conscious ethics and then you, yeah. If you say yes, it would actually be responsible for the killing of these people. Some couple? No, I didn't see anybody. There's nobody here. We're in the middle of nowhere. Nobody comes here. Oh, thank you. Gone. Not go in the house. Run that way. They went that way. You saved a life. So there's truth and there's higher truth and there's the highest truth. I think, I think it's just like Krishna asking Arjuna to kill. Killing is very bad. But not killing in that situation would be worse. Right? Why did Krishna ask to kill? Because if he didn't, it would have been worse. That's the point. So we look at lying and killing from a moral standard, but there's Transcendental standard is what will be best spiritually for everybody. Now, something really interesting. Do you know that Prabhupada said, if you just try to help people materially, it will put you in the bodily concept. Because if you're just helping them materially and not spiritually, you're catering to the body, which is Rajaguna. And by doing that seva only to the body, not to the soul, then you become infected by Rajagun yourself. I have personal experience of it. It's very interesting. Because how you try to help people, it comes back. That's why when you give people Krishna, you become more Krishna conscious. When you give people prasadam, that's wonderful. If you give people mundane help, it puts you more in a, a material concept. Isn't that interesting? So just like Prabhupada said, we should feed people within a 10 mile radius of the temple. Nobody should go hungry. Of course it's with prasadam. It's not that Prabhupada meant like, oh, just you know, people are suffering just, and you can help them. We don't help them because that's the bodily concept. No, it's not like that, but as a general rule, to go out and try to just help the body will kind of reinforce your own concept that you're the body. Believe it or not, that's how it works. Okay. My arrest found out Santa Claus didn't exist. That was the trauma of his life. He's never been the same since. So Diana Jackson is answering my question, which I forgot what it was. What do you tell them? Or do you lie? Or she said, I let them know people believe different things. Hitler was nice. It's probably nice to his cat, right? And his daughter. He just had a few other problems to work out. Yeah, these are you know, these are difficult issues that need discussion. I think there's a lot of people in history who are as bad or worse than Hitler that are not on the top five dictator list. And because if you're on the top five or 10 dictator list, nobody thinks there's anything good about you, but there may be. Also, it's possible. Kamal says, how important is it to have, uh, have a one-to-one -one traditional guru-disciple relationship? <clears throat> You mean like living in an ashram with your guru? Well, one, one devotee asked Prabhupada. She was a book distributor. She 
She said, Prabhupada, how can we have a more personal relationship with you after you leave? And I think this devotee was, oh yeah, she was um, doing Prabhupada's laundry. So she felt, was like, this is amazing. I, I get to touch Prabhupada's cloth. It's like full of Shakti. I get to wash and iron the clothes of a pure devotee, unlike other pure devotees that are just so special. So when Prabhupada was leaving, she was feeling like, how am I going to go on? I had this personal service. And, and she was a book distributor. And no, so when she asked the question, someone said, Prabhupada, she distributes books. And Prabhupada said, you continue distributing books. That was his answer for personal relationship, personal. So the traditional model, you know, we are Padibraja Kacharyas, itinerant preachers, we move around. So most gurus are not in one place. So you wouldn't be able to have that traditional relationship. Whatever that traditional relationship means, but as far as we understand, it means being in the ashram with the guru. So we don't even have a choice unless you have a guru in an ashram who doesn't go anywhere and you live there. So we can broaden the question. I think what Kamal meant was how important it is to have this close one-on-one. -on -one. Depends on the devotee what they need, but that can degrade into some kind of weakness where the devotee can't make a decision on their own. They can't think for themselves. So they too depend too much on their guru. So that's not healthy. But main thing is instruction and uh, yeah, at least I'm there when you need me. You have a we have a digital traditional relationship. We can call it that. A DT, we have a DTR. Kamal and I have a DTR, digital traditional relationship. But how traditional is it? Well, the base, you can say, okay, so the basics of it are traditional. All right. I'll surrender to that. Adriana from Mexico says, how can I know if I'm giving love to someone? How can I react when one friend of mine talks bad about Krishna consciousness? Should I get away from him? How can I support my village? Uh, you know the saying, Adriana, with friends like that, who needs, enemy? who needs enemies? When you're, here's the good news and bad news, depending on how, what angle you look at it, who you are, but Well, you're trying to become Krishna conscious, you kind of have to do a re-evaluation of friends and enemies. I mean, I don't know if you have any enemies, but a re-evaluation of friends, because you will realize that some friends are very bad for you, toxic for you. But before you were a devotee, they weren't, because you were not trying to be pure. Now that you're trying to be pure, you realize that their influence is bad. So... The answer to your question is it depends on the influence people are having on you. So I guess you're concerned about, well, if I broke the relationship, I would be not giving love. That's a concern. But I would also say you have to love yourself first. So start with yourself, love yourself. And then loving yourself means do what is best for your spiritual advancement. Because if you don't, you'll, you won't be able to help anybody. Should I get away from him if he's bad for you? How can I support my village? Distributing prasadam, teaching people to chant, distributing Prabhupada's books. That's a start. Engaging people in service teaching children, having a little place for children.
Nanda says, I'm guru disciple relationship topic. You want to ask a question? Hmm. Is there any substantial difference between the relationship of guru disciple Siksha Diksha? The in my In my understanding and experience, the only difference is in the eye of the disciple, how they see it. We read a letter yesterday. I don't think you heard it. I'm going to read it to you. And this had to be translated yesterday, so I can now read it without the translation. This is from Prabhupada. The initiation is a formality. First of all, you have to decide whether you will abide by the rules and regulations and become Krishna conscious. This is your consideration. In other words, before you talk about initiation, decide if you actually want to follow. And your consideration means it's your decision, nobody else's. You have to decide for yourself whether you are going to take this Krishna consciousness seriously. In other words, you have to make that decision, and Prabhupada is indirectly saying, make that decision, but you have to take that decision. That is your decision, initiation is a formality. So what does Prabhupada mean? He means once you take that decision, that's your initiation. Isn't that interesting? So he goes on to explain it. If you are serious, that is real initiation. If you are serious, that is real initiation. Whenever you became serious, you were initiated. If you have understood this Krishna philosophy and you have decided that you will take Krishna consciousness seriously and preach the philosophy to others, that is your initiation. So I'll read that again, three things. If you have decided you will take Krishna consciousness seriously, Preach it to others. Uh, and that is your initiation, two things. If you have decided to take Krishna consciousness seriously and preach to others, that is your initiation. So basically, Prabhupada saying once you become serious, then you're actually initiated. My touch is simply a formality. It is your determination. That is initiation. So siksha means instruction. So the main service of the guru is to give instruction. Siksha is a formality that was, what must be executed, particularly to do deity worship. Um, it's a facility to make vows and connect. But in the course of your progress, there may be gurus that play a very important role. And sometimes they play a more important role, like with Bhakti Nath Thakur. Jagannath Das Babaji played a much greater role in his life than did his Diksha Guru, Vipin Bihari Goswami. Now I have to end class, everyone, and I will say good night to you all. Sweet dreams. Uh, I made it, I made it for an hour and a half. You should be proud of me. And I kept my eyelids open. <laughs>